Yes, so I suppose I should just start by um, introducing myself. In my background, um, I studied chemical engineering and worked for a decade or so, and then became a chartered engineer until I had to retire due to ill health in about 2003. Um, and while I've been receiving sort of ongoing medical interventions since about 2005, I've been at times um, and I've been able to retrain and I'm now slowly retraining and doing my doctoral level qualification as a training counselling psychologist. And my area of um, knowledge and, and interest is looking particularly at um, the neuropsychological deficits in people with ME, but also in people with um, Gulf War illness, which have a very similar um, symptom profile and who got ill after the first Gulf War in the early 1990s. So what I look at um, in patients in my research, and then now um, um, more recently, because I've been asked to do by the patients what they're doing. Um, Susan has been leading what's called like a patient independent initiative and um, um, taking the GC math. But patients, uh, <laughs> patients have also asked me to assess them before and after any kind of interventions that they they may decide to undertake, so they may be like a medical intervention looking at endocrine um, um, correction, or it may be things like physical interventions looking at massage techniques, like the parent technique, and things like that, which are quite popular in the UK. So I look at um, symptoms and severity and the intensity that we have of multiple symptoms. They're self-reported and objective measures, and I look across multiple domains of function so that we're not missing any particular areas. So defining ME, this is really important because we've um, only really um, had people looking at this particular disorder in the literature really since the 1950s. Um, in 1955 there was an outbreak of an ME type illness at the Royal Free Hospital in London. Uh, that was attended mainly by the physician called Ramsey who wrote a very good description of it in the 1980s. Um, unfortunately, what we've had in the literature is we've had different criteria. So we've had these early criteria, which were initially um, and, and still are um, under the rubric of the neurological disorders um, by the World Health Organization. But we've also had criteria which include things like the Oxford criteria for CUDA, which is the one which is the most used largely within the UK, within the NHS, and in most of the literature. Um, but there are some problems with some of these um, some of these definitions, and some of these are very, very broad. The Oxford criteria, for example, largely required you to have six months of disruptive fatigue with reduced function below 50%, and you may or may not have other symptoms with that. So this is essentially fatigue, whereas this one, um, I'll go on and show you in a moment, is also has, has its weakness. So there's the problems with that is this, between the more restrictive and the more liberal criteria in the literature, it makes it really difficult to classify or to generalise from the literature as to who has had what and what is effective. I think that's created real problems with sort of misperceptions about the whole condition. And the any community, because this um, they introduced the term CFS or chronic fatigue in the 1980s, which which largely because it reflects a paucity of the knowledge on the on the etiology and has led to the sort of contradictory results within the literature. It's led, I think, to quite a lot of um, misperceptions some sort of cynicism, and I think it's by and large had quite a negative impact on how ME is viewed within the medical world, but also how it's viewed within the patient's world and within their social world with them, with family and so on. And I think um, all this has led to perhaps a lack of awareness of the complexity of the serious nature of ME, so this focus on this symptom of fatigue has largely led to the, to the other symptoms being, and being lessened. So limitations with the FACUDA, this one which is the most often used and the Oxford criteria, or well, neither of these two criteria have a requirement to have this, the core ME symptoms. And they are this neurocognitive and neuropsychological dysfunction, but also the post-exertional malaise and relapse and weakness and flu-like debility that, that patients with ME complain of. With the FACUDA criteria here, it's um, requiring to have six months of fatigue, so not lifelong fatigue, and then only, so it's a polythetic criteria, so you're looking at four from eight of the following other symptoms, so impaired concentration, sore throat, lymph node, bones, and so on, and post-exertion. So it doesn't require you to have the post-exertion in the laser, the neuropsychological deficits. It's often assumed um, that ME is the same as chronic fatigue syndrome, which is the same as chronic fatigue, which is a real problem as well, as we don't know if, if if um, data or research or clinical evidence 
that's based on chronic fatigue, whether that can be related at all to, to ME at all, so we also have this, have this problem. Um, more recently, um, Michael Mays and his group, he's um, differentiated using immunological biomarkers, um, these three groups, and also separating them into those with, without post-exertional malaise and biomarkers into the chronic fatigue group, the MU group requiring the biomarker plus post-exertional malaise and the chronic fatigue group are differentiated because they do not have the immunological biomarkers. So there are there's some starting evidence of hopefully some subgrouping here that will be used in, in future research. And there's a real need for caution um, with patients um, really need to be evaluated by any knowledgeable medical clinicians. As we have a situation in uh, Newcastle where they evaluated several years worth of all their referrals to their chronic fatigue syndrome. So it was this wide umbrella chronic fatigue syndrome diagnosis. And they found that 40% of the patients that were um, attending there did not, in fact, have any stroke CFS, but they had other conditions, mainly primary sleep disorders um, and psychiatric disorders. And also, um, I'm aware of um, particularly another um, paper whereby a third of MS patients, um, before they had their diagnosis of MS, one third of them had the diagnosis of chronic fatigue syndrome beforehand. So there's a real need um, to look at subtypes and ensure that patients are, you know, have what they say that they have. Okay, um, and here's a, a diagram from a paper by well, this group here um, in 2011. So you have the FACUDA criteria. So this is the. Oops. So we have the, the group here in the FACUDA criteria, so there's quite broad umbrella of chronic fatigue syndrome of 155, but only, of, only 97 of those met the Canadian Stroke International criteria, which is the one that I tend to use and the one which um, Professor Lodiero um, talked about earlier this morning. So the Canadian International Consensus Criteria, uh, first published in 2003, and it's been updated uh, in 2011. It provides clinicians and patients with a thorough understanding and description of the diversity of their symptoms, abnormalities and debility. It acknowledges the World Health Organization's neurological status. And more from a, a psychological and emotional point of view and, and patient management, um, from the qualitative literature, the patients describe this as diagnosis as the single most helpful event. Okay. And also that leads into early management of MECFS appears also to be a major determinant of later severity. So actually getting the diagnosis in a good timely manner is, is very helpful. And one of the things that's related to later severity um, is particularly things like physiotherapy and exercise, encouragement to exercise early on in the condition. And there is one of, one of the main symptoms of this, this post-exertional malaise, but also the reaction to exercise and the dysfunctional response, which is actually the, there is um, some good documents which are produced specifically for doctors um, from these two criteria, and they have a very nice clear table, and I can follow this to anyone who's interested, that shows all the abnormalities that happen in response to exercise in, in these patients. So the Canadian consensus criteria, so it requires the patients to have all of these symptoms here, so there's post-exertion malaise, the relapse, the flu-like weakness, and malaise, the neurocognitive dysfunction, which is often described by the patients as their worst symptom and the most debilitating, sleep dysfunction of some sort, pain and fatigue, and the fatigue must be present for at least six months, and plus one symptom from two of the following subgroups. So, overview of the assessments that um, I can do. So again, this can be undertaken before and after um, in a period of time for any intervention that a patient might be taking, whether that's a psychosocial intervention, like CBT-graded exercise, or um, other medical interventions that they, they may be wanting to, to find out what, what is helpful for them. So the rationale, what we're trying to do is provide a rigorous assessment, which can't always be done by other ways. Um, and what it is, it enables really the patient and the doctor to work together for common goals so they have a really good understanding of what is, what is ailing the patient. So in terms of um, communication, when I do an assessment, I, um, I write to the patient's GP or, and or their specialists and give them really comprehensive information as to how they are functioning or, or not functioning as the case may be. 
So I go through um, symptoms, looking to quantify severity and intensity of symptoms, looking at several measures of fatigue, well-being and, and health impact on their quality of life, neuropsychological tests, particularly focusing on attention, memory, motor control, and information processing, categorizing overall severity using um, Bell scale, which is like a modified Karnofsky scale. I have copies here if people would like. And, and there's some straightforward objective measures that patients can measure on their own using things like pedometers, their body temperature, and how many hours they're, they're, they're working before and after particular interventions. And also with uh, an idea from a, a consultant physician, we've, um, we've managed to put together a little two-day stair test. Uh, what this requires a patient to do is just climb, go up and down a uh, standard set of stairs several times, measuring their heart rate while they do that and measuring the time that it takes them to do it. What we try and do that is over two days, um, because their main symptoms is post exertional malaise. So they're able to perhaps perform on day one, but they usually can't perform that same test on day two, or if they do do it on day two, they, they take a lot longer. Okay, so symptoms and severity. Uh, we do a joint evaluation of myself and the patient with 71 symptoms based on the Canadian International Criteria. Um, this is really an extended version of um, this page 15 of the Canadian Consensus Criteria document. It has a table there about 20, 25 symptoms. I've just widened it up to 71. And we rate the, the symptoms from zero to absent, up to mild, moderate, severe. So one for mild, two for moderate, three for severe. And this gives a score um, at a particular point in time for the, for the patient. So from my MSc research work, um, ME patients average 103 out of a maximum of 230. 213, and healthy controls from that research, they average 4.7, so an average healthy sort of person is essentially sort of certainly less than 16, but ideally less than, than 10. Um, the consistency of the complexity of the symptoms, this is, this is really interesting. Um, going through these set of 71 um, symptoms, what I found is there's a very high test, retest reliability of the patients um, over, over, as they they still continue to have um, any symptoms. So, um, so for example, I assessed uh, a particular patient as part of my um, doctoral work back in 2008, and that gave a quantitative score of symptoms of 72. Um, he just asked me to reassess him, and he's now scoring at 75. So very, very consistent over, over that time. Um, in terms of quantitative score, but also in terms of what he was complaining of. So he was complaining of myelitis, cognitive dysfunction, the post-exertional malaise, weakness, fatigue, insomnia, multiple chemical sensitivities, body problems with body temperature control, and light and sound sensitivity. And his main symptoms that he's complaining of still five years later are exactly the same. So it's important that we define um, recovery. As what's happened in, or appears to have happened in the literature is we appear to be fudging the issue, I think, um, between sometimes when patients feel better and being better. And these things mean things which are quite different to the patient. Clearly patients want to feel better, but they want to be better, they want to be recovered and return to, to work and, and, and everyday activities. And we need to show these by objective measures as well as um, subjective measures as well. So. In the literature, there's been some um, discussion about this, as are we measuring the stabilisation, stroke adaptation of the patient, to improve their ability to be able to cope with their situation, and this is being um, termed sometimes as recovery, whereas in fact it's, it's not anything like, like recovery at all. Um, we've had uh, a psychosocial intervention that has been well evaluated in the UK, different ones including cognitive behavioural therapy, graded exercise activities and so on, and um, these this particular trial has um, shown a, a positive effect, but of a very small, modest effect size of about 0 0.3 in terms of their physical functioning, even though they're claiming that a, a, about 30% a, about of these patients have recovered. But um, when you look at the um, return to work figures in the McCrone paper here, you're finding that actually more patients are on sickness and capacity benefits um, after the intervention than they were before. So these figures don't appear to sort of make sense with um, perhaps more with this this adaptation rather than actually perhaps recovery is what we're measuring there maybe. Okay, and, and also Hayward, published in 2011, um, did a review of all the different measures that are used in clinical trials with um, patients with ME, and what they found was there was clear discrepancies between what is measured in research and how patients define their experience. And so we're missing, um, we're perhaps with this focus on the fatigue, we're actually missing a lot of the rest of the symptoms, we're missing a lot of the rest of what is actually important to the patients.
in terms of recovery. So neuropsychological tests, uh, what are we aiming to do? Um, looking at rigorous, robust, quantifiable testing of various neuropsychological deficits. Um, wanting to I use tests, particularly focus on ones which have high test retest reliability. And useful areas to measure looking things like verbal memory and learning, attention and motor control, and particularly this complex auditory information process and the speed and flexibility. This is often one of the areas where people with ME are more, more, um, more impaired. We um, use five tests, which give rise to 13 measures that can clearly separate ME from healthy controls. In general, people with ME are one to two standard deviations lower than healthy controls. And these are equivalent to the deficits found in, in patients with MS. Symptom severity generally relates to severity of deficits, but not always. And it's important to just um, bear in mind that these patients actually have some, some strengths, and their particular strength is verbal fluency, which I think is really important for um, clinicians to know, because the patient may come in and may present themselves verbally very, very well, but actually that doesn't mean that neuropsychologically or physically that they're actually at all well. And emotional well-being is actually one of their strengths. They, they, they appear to be able to cope incredibly well with the highly high level of debility that they, that they have. 